thank you everyone for joining us today uh and thank you adam for joining us uh we'll probably be on here for about an hour um i'll let adam introduce himself but just to introduce the structure of what's going to happen today Adam's going to give us a bit of a talk, talk a bit about his uh, his experience, his role, how he got into the role, uh, and and kind of then hopefully at the end answer any questions that you've got. Um, Adam, are you okay if people do have a, a question during the session, they can just type it in the chat and we can cool. kind of deal with it. Yeah. So if you've got like a pressing issue that you don't want to forget, type it in the in the chat um, on the side and we'll we'll deal with that as we go. Um, but I'm just gonna hand over to you adam and hopefully yeah well uh, so i want this session to be as helpful for everybody um who's listening in as possible so trying to think about um my beginnings uh, as a director I, I just i want to try and give you uh some insight into the experiences i've had working in tv and film because uh, i've been a director for over 20 years um my story is that i um i grew up in yorkshire used to make short films as a teenager and I decided that I actually uh, wanted to move into doing TV and film but there weren't really many opportunities up in that area so I, uh, I moved to London and I ended up going to the University of Westminster and I mean for me that was that was an amazing three years because uh, probably like you guys have just got to completely immerse myself in film and TV um, and actually start working with some collaborators for a change because um, you probably all have the same experience but if you've ever started off making your own projects initially you're, you're making things by yourself and then suddenly you're thrown in with a whole bunch of people where you, you're working with proper script writers producers people who want to specialize in uh, as, as DPs and things like that so for me that was the opportunity to start making short films where as a director I wasn't trying to do everything myself and start building relationships with people that after university I carried on working with these collaborators. Um, so anyway, I, I've, uh, my graduation film, I ended up making a graduation film which uh, went on to win a number of uh, awards overseas and that actually became my calling card to get into film and television. So really, um, ha again, having grown up in Yorkshire, I, I didn't have any contacts and there was no, uh, I had no link to the industry at all. And I, I'd probably say that one of the, um, one of the issues with the, um, probably with the film school is that as great as it was making all the films, it never really quite prepared me for what happens when you come out the other side. Because when you actually try and break into the industry, um, I soon recognised quite quickly that uh, so much of it was to do with having some contacts, having some people who could, um, Give you opportunities so I quickly discovered that I needed to build up my contact base so I started running on music videos and doing commercials which was great so basically um, that involved uh, kind of being used and abused slightly and doing crazy hours on, on big productions but it gave me exposure to big scale things that I'd never really experienced before. I used to uh, work on uh, Fatboy Slim music videos. I did some work with a company called Partisan for a while, which did lots of uh, large scale uh, commercials. So suddenly I was actually getting to watch directors firsthand for the first time, actually with a larger budget, filming in studios, filming with uh, a, you know really large crews of over a hundred people, which I'd never really experienced before. And actually, just being on set and being around uh, directors who've been doing it for a long time, you learn you learn lots of little tricks of the trade very quickly. Um, and then really progressing from that, I ended up finding myself working in, in television for a while. So when I was probably about 23, 24, I'd spent quite a lot of time running. I wasn't really making a lot of money from it, but I think I was always determined to try and... Um, sell myself as, as a director. I, I knew that there were two routes into the industry. I mean, one route was to start very much at the bottom level and try and work your way through. Or the other way was to try and be quite um, vocal about um, what I wanted to do, to, to do, which was directing, and let people know about it. So if I got the opportunity to speak to producers that I was working with, I would always try and show them um, 
some of my showreel work or try and tell them about the things I was interested in. And actually what happened was that one of the producers I was working with, one day uh, a director let it down last minute. And it wasn't a particularly big project. But for me, I saw it as an opportunity where I thought, well, actually, if I could get onto that and actually use that as an opportunity to do some directing, that would be my first professional directing gig. So anyway, I said to her, I said, look, don't pay me. Just take my fee and put it into toys for the project so we could have steady cam and the right crew to work with and ended up shooting something which um, went down very well with the producers and the TV company and that in turn uh, meant that I I, uh, I sort of built a relationship with the company which was Thames Talkback and Fremantle um, at the time so um, suddenly I found myself directing quite large TV shows for ITV um, and doing projects for, for the international market, which um, I have to say, I mean, at the time I, I was, I, f- I felt like I was completely winging it because I'd, I'd gone through the experience of being at university where um, I'd say you, you, you are, you can be in a bit of a bubble and you haven't really got your head around the sort of the, um, <laughs> the kind of the, the, almost like the politics or, or the, the different roles that uh, you have within television. I mean, I had no idea what a production manager was. I didn't know what a line producer was. Um, because really, when you're making a student film, those sort of roles didn't really apply. I mean, the budget's there. The schedule's kind of set up, you know, roughly that you just have to achieve that little project. But then suddenly, if you're working in television, um, there can be quite a large budget. There's a lot of people. You're answerable to the executive producers and all this sort of stuff. So very quickly, I was thrown at the deep end trying to um uh, you know um o- almost um le- yeah learn on the job if you like as we were making these projects so i did that for a number of years and um i had some great experiences i mean i think with television um and i, I-, I might uh, if if i'm speaking out of turn here i mean i assume that some of you guys will have interest in tv i assume some of you will be interested in film and for me, my interests have always been uh, more the film side, but I've ended up finding myself working primarily in TV. And actually, I've been lucky to have a, a nice balance of the two things. But with television, it allowed me to um, to have some amazing experiences that really I don't think you would ever get in any other industry. Because from quite an early age, I found myself uh, traveling around, going overseas a lot, uh, working with some fascinating people. I mean, when I talk to people who um, who aren't necessarily in the industry but are interested in my experiences working in TV, they, they 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 say, you know, what's the best aspects of it? And I say, well, you 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 know, you're in this privileged position where you can uh, quickly jump from project to project and work with amazing people um, that you would never get anywhere near. Yeah, usually. So you can be working with politicians, Hell's Angels, Shannon Monks, um, comedians, scientists. I mean, these are all people that I've worked with over the years because all the TV shows I've done have always been very, very different. And it also allows you the opportunity to uh, to travel. So if you like, um, you know, like that sort of nomadic lifestyle and enjoy seeing the world, obviously TV gives you, uh, gives you those opportunities. Um, I was working in TV for for about three or four years when I, um, I, I joined a company called Objective Productions. And Objective, um, I don't know if you're familiar with them, they were a, a really big uh, independent uh, TV production company that did, that did all sorts of stuff. And at the time, um, they their flagship show was a, a show called um, Darren Brown, Trick of the Mind. And I don't know if you're familiar with Darren Brown, but he's, um, he's an amazing magician and... Uh, uh, illusionist and he, he's, he's, he's just a remarkable character who um, had this amazing show in Channel 4 and I joined the company started doing some hidden camera shows for them and then after a couple of years um, they gave me the opportunity to start directing Darren's shows so for me that was that was an amazing um, breakthrough because suddenly I was directing the one show that I watched on TV as a you know as a student I always thought if it was one TV show that I'd love to direct it would be the Darren Brown shows because for me they 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 did 
Um, that I found, I, I just thought they were really groundbreaking. They're always quite cinematic. Visually, they're amazing. Darren is incredibly talented, and he always came up with lots of uh, unique ideas for his shows. And and it, it was, there's quite a dark sensibility to it anyway, because I've I've done some of my projects. You might may or may not know, but have elements of horror and uh, thriller aspects to them. So I was really drawn to that. And again, um, very quickly, I was thrown in at the deep end working on this uh, very big show where um, there are an enormous amount of moving parts to it. And it was a very complex show put together, but it was well funded by Channel 4. And um, yeah, we were doing some incredible stunts. I mean, I remember there was one day where we were doing, <laughs> we were doing a stunt and it, um, it was for, for a show actually called Trick or Treat. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I mean, this is going back 10 to 15 years, so this may be you know, going back quite a long way for you guys, but all the all the clips are on line still. There's many of them on YouTube, but the show is called Trick or Treat. And in the show, Darren would do a, um, he would do a, um, a thing at the beginning of the show where he almost invited people to join him for a, a Faustian pact where they would apply to go on the show. He would turn up and sort of ambush them when they weren't expecting it and present them with two cards. And depending on what card they were given, they would either experience uh, a trick or a treat in the series, but they wouldn't know what was lined up for them. And it always involved some big elaborate stunt that Darren would do on them when they were least suspecting it. So basically you walk away, we'd go plan something for three or four months and we'd come back and do the big stunts. And these stunts were usually um, very ambitious, sometimes quite dangerous. And one instance we had, we had... Uh, a young lady that was interested in escapology and we had to do, uh, we trained her to do uh, an, an escapology water stunt where she had to escape from a bag in a lake. And um, the setup was that we, um, we basically bundled her into the back of a van in the middle of the night, drove her up to a lake near Pinewood Studios. Um, I probably had about 40 cameras on it, it was it was insane technically. I mean, and logistically, there was so much, um, so many moving parts to it that the stunt ran for about six or seven hours. Um, so from the moment it started right through to the moment where she did the escape in the lake, she didn't know she was about to go into it. She, um, we had to have cameras everywhere, following the truck that she was in, um, waiting by the lake. Uh, we had underwater divers in the lake with her filming so um so by the time he got to the end of the stunt um i was just you know you can imagine like the adrenaline that you have going through because you're thinking i hope this is safe i hope this is going to work obviously your job as a director is to make sure that all these um big elaborate stunts no matter how dangerous they might seem um all the safety aspects are covered and everybody is going to come out of it um um, happy and unscathed from the whole experience. So anyway, we, we shot the, the ex we shot the stunt. She did the escape, and it was remarkable. But um, I remember at the end of the day, just thinking, I can't believe how many cameras and how many crew we had on these. It was almost like trying to do uh, an action sequence uh, in real time, where you didn't have the luxury of cutting the cameras and moving the crew around. It all had to be set up and planned in advance and hidden at the same time, so she she didn't know quite what was going on. So things like that, I'd say for me, um, being thrust into that sort of world very quickly, you started to get, um, you started to build my confidence and make me realise um, uh, what could be achieved if you're working with the right people and with you know the time to plan these things. Um, so I did that for a while. I used to do um, a show called um, Tri uh, The Real Hustle as well. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that was a big show that was on BBC One and that was also... A big hidden camera show where we were doing again sort of stunts and trying to do um, uh, almost like real time uh, high stakes cons where um, the people involved didn't realize what was happening and okay we, i've lost Ad adam has everyone else lost adam at this point I yeah got, yeah, I'm yeah. Not, uh, yeah. Well. Okay, we'll wait for him to catch up. Um, I was always aware. I, I Sorry, to... Adam, we, yeah. we lost you for a minute there. You froze. Oh, did I? 
literally just as you were about to describe the, the the show in a bit more detail you froze up sorry which one but for the real hustle was it yeah yeah okay fine sorry sorry so just jump in again if i freeze but um i was saying that so with the real hustle that was a show for bbc3 and it ran for a long time it was the most popular show on the channel for quite a number of years i think we did about 11 series in the end but the idea was that again that was a big elaborate um hidden camera show where it was we had a, a number of magicians and people who had experience working as as con men i mean they weren't actually con men but people who understood that world and what we would do is we would set up hidden cameras sort of high high stake scams and cons where the um people would go on the show they weren't aware they were necessarily being filmed but they would find themselves in the middle of a a big um a, a, a big scam or con scheme and um, I really it really was an exercise in trying to show the audience how to avoid the pitfalls of these things but again um, it was involving hidden camera and there were lots of moving parts to it and that was um, that was an exciting thing to be involved with and I think as a result of that I started doing more entertainment shows and then um, started doing sort of Saturday night entertainment shows. So I worked with Anton Deck, I uh, worked with Jonathan Ross, Alan Carr, Davina McCall. Um, and being in that world, again, was very interesting because I suddenly went from doing more factual entertainment shows and hitting camera shows to doing sort of big Saturday night things where, for me, that was a, a completely new experience again because I'd um, previously... Doing doing something like a Darren show, you shoot it all and then you sort it out in the edit. But doing live entertainment shows on a Saturday night where it's being broadcast and going out to say like eleven or twelve million people at the time, that was a that was a kind of a different adrenaline rush altogether because I'd never really experienced doing live TV shows. But the difference with that is that you would spend uh, the entire week um, planning the show, rehearsing it, bringing in all the big guests, guests and names who would appear on it do the dress rehearsals on the Saturday, again, with a big team of people that we used to uh, film these shows down at the London studios on the South Bank. And then um, and then when the show went out the evening, there was just like that mad, crazy one hour where it was just seat of the pants, the show would go out. Um, it's almost like a big juggernaut that once, once the momentum starts and the show is on air, there's nothing... <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like landing a jumbo jet, really. You just have to make sure that the show comes in on time hits all the beats and everything works as it did in the rehearsals. But by the time you're finished, that's it. It's job done. It's gone out on TV. And then everybody, um, you know, uh, has a big celebratory party in the green rooms backstage afterwards. So that, for me, was a very different world and a different departure from all the previous shows I've made where everything was pre-shot and then you'd spend months and months in the edit crafting a TV show from it. Um... So that was interesting. And I think over the years, I, I've started to, um, I got to the point where I was making a bit of uh, a name for myself for working with maybe high profile talent and TV, uh, TV names who, let's say there was a, a big promo or something for um, Comic Relief or Stand Up to Cancer, I would often come in and do the sketches with um, high profile celebrities for that. So that was always interesting because I think over the years I'd worked with people like Ricky Gervais or Samuel Jackson and Richard Gere, uh, Diana Ross, um, all sorts of names. And every time you do these shoots, you're never quite sure what you're going to get yourself into. I mean, generally, um, most of these people are all always amazing and they're very charming characters. And um, it's, it's always an experience being in that world with them. But you have to uh, – there is definitely – a way to sort of handle those shoots that uh, to make sure it goes swimmingly, <laughs> uh, because you know almost like the bigger the name, the more used to they are. They're, they're they're more accustomed to everything being super slick. They come in, they want it shot very quickly, and they get out again. They're not ones for really hanging around or um, um, spending a second longer on the shoot than than they really need to. So for those sorts of shoots, that's always been interesting because. Um, Whereas I come from a background where I like to spend time crafting things, with that you have to be almost like militaristic in the planning and make sure that everything's set up, you know what you're going to achieve, the crew goes in, shoots it very quickly and you get out again as quickly as you can. Um, and then you're dealing with the personalities on top of that. So obviously quite a lot of these characters 
they um they usually have a big entourage around them they have a lot of people i did a shoot um a couple of years ago i think it was for um comic relief for stand up to cancer and it was uh, it was with david beckham but again you can imagine there was probably about 30 or 40 people around him who all are for marketing pr maybe they're squeezing in other shoots on that same shoot day um so you know your, your time is precious and every second in that in that little window that you've been given sort of counts so that experience has been good for me in that when I now deal with high profile celebrities or from dealing with act- named actors I'm kind of used to it I think initially the very first time you walk into a room with uh, maybe a big name that you've seen in a movie or a tv show um, it's this kind of out of body surreal experience and you do get starstruck because suddenly you, you know you might be talking to Will Smith and before that he's just this construct that you've seen on the movie screen and then suddenly having a conversation with him trying to explain what he's going to be doing on your tv show that evening so dealing uh, getting getting used to that and not having to um, um, just just accept that these people they're all professionals they're all there they're doing a job and you know you um you you talk to them on a level that they understand that's been very helpful for me um but away from all the tv side i should say that i my ambition was always to move more into film and drama and actually the first couple of tv well um the first TV experiences I had got me into the more factual comedy and entertainment route, and I was always pushing to more get into the the scripted side of things. So I started thinking, how do I um, how do I get back into doing the thing that I had always wanted to do, to do since university? And I, I would say I was probably about twenty seven, twenty eight, and I th- started thinking um, it was probably we've lost you again, Adam. We'll just wait for him to uh, rejoin us. Got to love the internet. I, uh, Sorry, Adam, we, <laughs> we lost you again for a while. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh. Please bear with me. Yeah, no, it's fine. As if you could just hold the line for one second, I'm just going to try something just to sort out my booster. One second. Okay. Uh, the pitfalls of working online. Uh, is that any better or not? Uh, we can hear you, can't see you, but... Um, okay. Interesting. Apologies, guys. There we go. Can see you. Any better? Can hear you. I mean, it, was, it was funny, it literally just froze up. So let's let's just get, we got to, uh, you were kind of literally got to the point where you were like, I, I, I kind of want to get back into film. Yes, yeah. So, um, so in brief, I, I started working with a producer and a writer and we started developing um, some short films. And the thinking was, well, if, if we could make a really strong 10 or 15 minute short film, that might be a gateway or a calling card into making films and obviously I've been making films at university but it's been probably um, getting close to 10 years since I've really made a short film again so the story is that we we made a short film called Raw I don't know if uh, any of your students might have seen that Clint I've I've certainly used it as a teaching tool before um, with some of the level sixes that are on here. So um, hopefully they they will have seen it. And I did put some links on Classroom. So hopefully a few other people will have seen it. Got it. Okay. Um, Yeah. Well, the story was that, um, so my friend Joe, he'd written this great. um, I want to spoil it, but I describe it as a thriller um, set in London at Christmas time. And it's about this young key cutter who um, um, obviously works in a key cutting shop and basically you follow him on a night through London and it goes to some pretty unexpected dark places and there's a nice twist in the tale. But I've been looking for short fil- a short film script to make for a long time and he kept on reading them and, and I was always struggling 
with them because sometimes with a short film you, you're trying to tell a nice contained story in 10 or 15 minutes that feels satisfying and I always thought um, either the, the scripts I was re were reading felt like they wanted to either be longer stories or they felt a little bit slight and when I read Raw to me it's a, it felt like it was the kind of like the perfect little story because it, it, it just um, it had a nice twist in the tale it worked uh, yeah, it worked within the constraints of the time period, and because it had like a limited number of locations, it meant that it was a piece that I could concentrate on to um, to really um, uh, uh, kind of lock into the performance and work with the actors, um, work with the DP, but not get too bogged down with trying to uh, cover lots and lots of locations, which always becomes very costly and logistical. If you're trying to do a short film, um, so anyway, we made the short. It had Russell Toby in it, who is uh, you, you may be familiar with, but he, he, he's on TV all the time at the moment. Uh, Jodie Whittaker, who is now Doctor Who, and uh, a guy called Tom Burke, who's also another brilliant actor. And at the time, they all, all those guys they they were um, making a name for themselves in TV, and all their careers have shot off since since then, in the last ten years. Um, but we made the shorts. We um, we sent it out to the festivals, and we were finding that it was actually getting a really good reception in America. Funnily enough, it didn't play very well in Europe, and I think that's because if you do see the film, it sort of presents itself as one thing, and there's a bit of a twist, and it becomes something else. And I'm not sure the, audi the European audience necessarily got it, but I think the Americans really uh, really liked it. So we started sending it out to festivals through a, a website called Without a Box, which if you ever do your own short films and want to get your films out into the big festivals that really count uh, without a box is like an online website where you can, it's very simple. You can upload your film, do the paperwork and you basically pay uh, to submit it to the fest festivals one at a time. It's a very nice, simple way of doing it. But anyway, we, we got in some big American festivals and it played in, um, uh, in, in the LA festival, Hamptons, Rhode Island, things like that and start picking up some awards. And as a result, um, it, it got me um, representation with a, a, a big Hollywood agency called William Morris. And in turn, at the same time, we've been developing uh, our first feature script. And, um, and that became a real game changer because what happened was that um, because we were presenting ourselves as like a little uh, creative trio, We'd had a short film which was getting a lot of attention, and at the same time, we'd been developing a couple of film scripts, and that that actually became hugely helpful in um, being taken seriously, very simply, and trying to get finance involved and finding high-profile profile actors to, um, to 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 take the time to read the scripts. Because what would happen was that if with our with our film projects, we would. Um, have the agency send the, the say a high profile actor the, the script and they'd, they'd send the short film at the same time because it was just really asking 10 or 15 minutes of their time they'd watch it kind of really got what we were about and then be much more inclined to talk to us about the film scripts and get and it just just became a great door opener um because people could see what your tone and style were. They, they, they got an understanding of what you were trying to achieve and they could tr transpose what they took from the short film onto the reading of the feature scripts. Um, so yes, so we, we started developing some films and if you ever get lucky enough to start developing films and having some traction in this area, um, <laughs> you'll find that it's a, it's a very slow glacial process. Um, I hadn't quite recognised at the time just what a um, uh, a long, laborious process raising finance for a film can be. Because unlike television, where with TV um, it's 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 very it's a very direct and straightforward industry in some respects. With television, all the uh, channels always have gaps in their schedule and they have a budget and very simply if they commission you to make a tv show for them you know it's going to happen they'll tell you what the budget is they'll tell you what the slot is and off you go it's very simple now with film um i'm making a big studio film if you're making an indie film nobody really ever needs your film it's not like the cinema are crying out for your indie film it's almost like it's something that you have to will into existence and you have to um uh kind of uh, push that the, that the, up the hill 
to to get it made. So um, the process is obviously finding the finance, attaching the cast, and quite often um, it's a like a chicken and egg scenario because what happens is that people who have money who want to put money into feature films, they want to know that there's an actor of note um, that they can sell the film on the back of. So um, if you walk into a financier's office and say, we've got Brad Pitt who wants to do our film, that's great. I mean, it's all signed up. They will give you a, le like a, a, a letter, which is like a letter of agreement saying they're committed to the film and obviously it becomes very simple. But then quite often the actors also want to know that the money's there because they don't want to commit themselves to doing a film until they know that um, the finance is in place. So you have this very strange situation where you're having to feel your way with it and try and get actors to read scripts and finances to take an interest. And um, and it's also a house of cards because what happened to us on a number of occasions were that we would um, line up quite big actors, but then uh, somebody's schedule changed. So we had, um, at one point, I had Orlando Bloom attached to one of the projects we were doing, and then he ended up making The Hobbit and said, look, I can't do it for 18 months. I'm, I'm busy working on another project um, um does that work for you and, and it's you put in this very tricky situation all of a sudden where you think well do we wait for another 18 months or do you just kind of move ahead and try and keep recasting so um yeah you have all these challenges with raising finance for a film um but anyway in the end we did uh, get our, one of our films away we made a film called blackwood and the story with that is that we um, we had uh, an amount of money for another film, which didn't happen, which was this Orlando Bloom thriller. And it was getting bigger and bigger, and it was becoming more and more costly. And in the end, the film, for various reasons, just didn't happen. But we did have some money in place still with a financier. So we said, right, OK, we've got a film called Blackwood. It's a supernatural um, um, thriller. It was almost like a haunted house style story so it was fairly contained in some respects there weren't again there weren't too many locations it didn't really involve a big cast but it felt like a cinematic story so we took some of that money and put it into making that film and that film all happened just very very quickly because we recognized that if we were ever going to do this it all had to happen um kind of immediately i think we'd spent a number of years waiting to get this other film financed and happening and we just got to the point where we thought unless we kind of do it now and just jump on it and take this small pot of money and put it into this project um it will just it, it could slip away very quickly so what happened was we um we went from talking about it to sort of shooting it within about two months which is a very quick turnaround because quite often if you're prepping a feature film you maybe have two or three months prep minimum to set it all up and we ended up having about um six weeks to really get all the pieces in place, can find the locations, and then we shot it all very quickly um, over a, a winter a number of years back, and um, and it was an amazing experience because it was the first time I'd actually made a film where um, it was a feature length film. We had a you know a full crew working with us for about a six week period, and it really um, it was it, it was yeah it was almost like the ultimate film school for me because I'd taken everything that I'd learned previously doing the short films and TV work and kind of tried to push everything I'd learned from those experiences into making this this feature and um, <laughs> we didn't make life easy for ourselves because um, we had found this amazing house which we were going to use because the, the house was a, a big feature of the story given it was a um, a supernatural thriller and the story was about a family moving to a um, what they think is a, a haunted house as in the countryside and it actually really it becomes slightly more of a, a psychological story but um, we wanted to do it in the depths of winter because it lent itself very well to the this kind of frosty um, uh, what's the word almost like sort of um, the, the, the the dynamics within the family were all quite broken. It didn't seem that shooting it in the height of summer with um, leaves on the trees and it all being very sunny and pleasant outside worked for the story. So we did it in winter time. But as a result, um, we ended up getting caught out by lots of snow. So what happened was we uh, we were shooting the project and then um, 
we did all the interiors for about four or five weeks, which was fine because it was all indoors. But then, um, for various reasons, we did all the the location stuff afterwards, after Christmas, outdoors, where we had two or three weeks. And quite often, if you're doing a film project, what happens is that um, it's scheduled so you have um, weather cover. So say you're doing a studio, um, say you're working in a studio, you'll go out and do your location work, but should, should it rain or the, you know, should it snow like it did with us, you go indoors and you go back into the studio and go, okay, that's fine, that day's all right, I'll we'll just move, the, move things around. Well, we didn't have the luxury of that. And what happened was that um, we were about two days into doing all, all the exterior shoot and there was a huge snowstorm. And we were shooting down in the Surrey Hills where it was very high up. We were in the forests. It was a very tricky location to get to in the first place. And um, it, I remember standing on set about nine o'clock in the morning. We were doing the first shot of the day and the assistant director was looking up at the sky going, well, there's snow clouds over there. And then it cut, cut to about two hours later and we were about a foot deep in snow and it was just a just a blizzard. And what happened was we just had to kind of cut and run, leave all the Arri trucks with all the camera equipment up on a hill and just abandon the shoot for about two weeks because there was so much snow. Um, it ruined all the continuity because everything we'd shot up until that point didn't have snow, so we had to step away from it, leave all the camera trucks there. And it was a real problem because we didn't have we didn't have a big budget for the film. And usually, say let's say you're doing a studio film, they kind of go, oh, okay, fine, it's an insurance cover, we'll, we'll just find some more money for it. But we didn't have that luxury. So we were sitting around going, oh, God, what do we do? Do we rewrite the script? Do we just start tearing pages out of the film and deleting scenes and taking the money from 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 other places and uh, in the end we came up with some creative solutions to it but we we had to stand the entire crew down go back and reshoot it and um and basically uh, compromise on a couple of things we were doing and came out the end with a film and we at one point we were really not sure if we'd actually have a film to show for it at the end of it because it was so problematic um but it worked out it was good and it was a good experience and for me, um, I'd say one of, I, I did have a couple of big takeaways from doing that project. Um, I mean, the first one was perhaps working with actors. Now, I'm sure you guys have had experience working with actors um, already, and you've been making short films um, where you, you're obviously doing scripted work. But I haven't have had any sort of sustained periods of time working with actors where you were trying to create a narrative over 90 minutes and certainly a narrative where you're basically watching uh, a group of say seven people all slowly uh, unravel and all their relationships and unravel. And what was interesting was, uh, is like, how do you, how do you track a film like that emotionally, especially when you are shooting the entire film out of sequence? Because um, as you probably know, when you make a film, you don't do it sequentially. Um, I mean, gi given the opportunity, I'd always love to start on the very first page and finish at the end, but you, you can't always achieve that. So we were shooting all over this house, all out of order, so we could shoot out each room at a time. Um, and um, it, was, it, was, it was interesting because you, I was thinking, well, how do you, how do you emotionally get the actors into the right place? Because um, it's um, the, the, the actors, they, 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 you know, they need, obviously need the handholding. They need the reassurance that what they're doing is pitched right. So if, if you were drawing their emotional um, arc throughout the story down, you could almost like plot it as a graph and sort of see where they peak and they fall. And obviously if you're shooting scenes out of order, we might have an actor walking out of one room and then next time you pick up the scene it might be three weeks later and that actor has to have that same emotional consistency so i found that actually um trying to sit down with the actors in advance or every time we weren't shooting just trying to sit down go through the script really kind of plot their journey and kind of create a backstory with them so they got to a place where you had done a lot of the chat away from the actual set because Again, I think in my earlier experiences of working with actors, I think there was this tendency to try and go in and sometimes over-direct them and sort of try and give them as much information as possible 
on the day. And I saw that it can become quite confusing for the actors because you're trying to give them almost like what they call um, result oriented direction. So you're overcomplicating things by saying, trying to give them emotional beat to hit throughout the, the scene and saying, and then you do this and you look over there and then you're angry and then I want you to go over there and do that. And the actors, you're, you're, you're kind of stifling their input into the storytelling because they are storytellers. They're trying to make their character come to life. And what I discovered is that if you actually can spend quality time with them in advance, talking about maybe what their uh, maybe what their characters have been through, even create a backstory which might not be on the page, but give them enough so that maybe any of the emotional damage or um, the the things that make them who the person that they are today, you've given them some sort of reason in their past to get to that point. When you're on set with these actors, um, you almost develop a shorthand with them very quickly where you can get them back into that headspace by talking about those previous discussions that perhaps you had with them and then go into the scene by just just giving them like small nuggets of information or or, or suggestions where maybe they, there's a, there's an action or a desire that you want them to go into the scene uh knowing uh, which actually weirdly will will um feed into the scene and actually drive all their decisions throughout the entire scene. So rather than trying to go in and sort of micromanage their entire performance, let them um, get there themselves by um, having an emotional objective that they're trying to achieve. So for example, um, we'd maybe do a take in a scene where um, you realize, I'd say to um, Ed Stoppard, the actor, look in this scene, you, um, you know, you're, you're trying to placate your wife. You're, you're, you're doing everything you can to smooth it over. This, the, the, the text on the page might seem argumentative, but you're trying to take the edge off. Or alternatively, you might do another take where you're saying, look, you want to, um, you know, you want to, her to realise that, um, you know, you're, you're being taken for granted or something, something simple, which is almost creates uh, the foundations for the actor to play that scene. I found that those... Um, those bits of direction where you can sit back, give the actors uh, the space to to play and sort of find the scenes themselves and then step into it and then give them notes afterwards after you've seen what they, um, they've come up with. Because actually I think if you, there's this tendency to, if you try and over-rehearse and over-rehearse, you can, can actually start to kill a scene. You can see that the, the, the life goes out of it and the actors almost are anticipating the beats but if you can actually uh, still create some spontaneity for them, that's when things really come to life in front of the camera. Um, so, you know, blocking is one thing. You go in and sort of rehearse them and let them understand where they need to stand, but just not try and rehearse the whole scene full tilt. But when you go for it on the day, just you know, re record the rehearsals, just see what they come up with. Because it's amazing how many times maybe in a rehearsal, they would they would absolutely nail it or come up with something really surprising. Um, and I even started shooting the rehearsals sometimes where they weren't even aware that the rehearsals were being shot because sometimes when they guards down and they don't feel like they're, they're on or really performing, that's sometimes where you get some of the good stuff. Um, so all those little things were great takeaways for me. And I felt like that was almost like my uh, <laughs> equivalent of going to... Um, you know my 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 next film school if you like it was almost a um experience itself um can i just check clint are you still there i am indeed still here yes i'm just letting you, you haven't broken up so i've just been letting you you carry on so i'm still fine. fine no problem so anyway so we um we made the film um we sold it to um, Universal and BBC America and we had a, a film premiere at the London Film Festival which was amazing because we got to do the whole red carpet bit at the um, uh, in Leicester Square which was uh, certainly a first and um, did quite a lot of Q&A sessions which was always interesting because uh, you know if you make a film yeah, I, I, it, to actually present it to an audience for the first time I can't quite describe the experience because it's it's, it's equally terrifying and rewarding because if you see the audience 
reacting to uh, maybe a jump scare or there's a you know there's a, there's a big moment in the film where you're you're hoping that the audience will react in a, a certain way and you're seeing 500 people in a room collectively inhale at a certain moment that can be an amazing thing but at the same time it feels like um <laughs> it's a bit like presenting your homework to to uh, to 500 people and you 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 kind of you know you're sitting at the back terrified by what the reaction is going to be but yeah, doing the Q and A's were great, and you, at the film festivals, you obviously get to meet lots of other interesting filmmakers and hear their stories. And I think really anybody who gets a film on screen these days, it's a credit to them because it's um, it's not, as I say, it's not easy. It can take easy. It's a big, um, it has to be a big labour of love, and, it, and these things are passion projects. So just seeing them actually um, um, see the light of day and actually come out and find an audience at the end of it is. Um, it's quite an amazing thing. Um, Clint, I was just going to say, can I can I just pause just for one second? I'm just going to plug in uh, a charger. Into my, Go for uh, it, yeah. One second. Okay, sorry. It's been te- all sorts of technical fun today. Right. How's that? You still there, Clint? All good. Everyone's still here. Good. I don't know if at this point, I don't know if anyone has any questions to ask about the film at all or the experience of doing, uh, putting a feature together. Anyone? Or are we saving them for the end? That's fine. Can wait to the end if that's easier. I can save it to the end. It's more about sort of equipment wise. <laughs> okay. Do, do you want me to save it to the end? Sure. Or? Yeah, save the equipment one to the end if that's all right, Craig. But George, you've got a question. Hi, um, I'm I'm actually going into the acting industry, and um, I just want to know when you're because I because I'm probably going to be doing both stage and film. When you're auditioning someone for a film role, what what is it that you particularly look for in that? Like depending on what the role is, or what is it that you look for when you're wanting when you're wanting that kind of overall character in your show yeah. or film well it's interesting because um i don't know if any of you have been through quite a rigorous casting process before but um usually when you're if you're going back to the beginning of making a feature film um as i said trying to get um Finance and board is usually dependent on getting a few names on board. So you have a casting director who will come in and and try and lock in a couple of bigger names. But then obviously they will start casting all the other roles as well. And they're not necessarily names, but they will present you with um, lots of people that they've seen over the years and who think are great. So they'll do a casting call, go out to all the agencies, bring in a collection of of people for you to look at. Sometimes often based around your casting brief. So as a director, I'll I'll read a script and... uh, um, try up with my own ideas about what that person should be. So maybe sometimes what's written on the page, you might say, I don't know, one of the characters is a you know forty year old white man, and then you realise that actually that's maybe the obvious way to go, but you want to change it up, or you know, let's make the character a female. I mean, that's obviously extreme, but you try and come up with um, casting briefs where you try and subvert the ideas sometimes, or you say to the casting. Uh, casting um, director surprised me with things but um, it will work one of two ways you'll either go into a workshop where you'll spend all day meeting actors and the benefit of that for me is actually being in the room with them you can actually give them direction and um, I, I find that hugely helpful because what will happen is say say they um, say they've been given a, a scene to rehearse they will have made their own ideas up about how that scene should be played. I'll try and not direct them at all initially. I'll, I'll just let them run through the scene, see what they've come up with, because actually sometimes being too prescriptive can uh, can be a bit suffocating for them or, you know, be, throw them a curveball that suddenly their ideas become redundant and I don't want that to happen. So I'll see what they do first and then second time around I'll run the scene again, but I'll try and give them some different... and maybe come up with... Um, a different angle to it that may, maybe they haven't seen. And that will um, allow me to do a couple of things. I mean, the the, the the big thing is 
can they take direction? So you, some actors are brilliant that they will just roll with the ideas. And then other actors, you'll find that maybe they, they just can't, they, they just do one thing, they might do that one thing very well, but they, they, they're not as malleable. And you want to try and work out, um, yeah, you work, work, work out what the, the strengths and the weaknesses of that person are. But also, um, I've very often gone in with a, a, a preconception about what an actor, what sort of actor I would like in the role. And maybe the casting director has brought in somebody who was completely, you know, completely different to as it's written on the page. And we ended up going with them um, because it's, it, they do something really exciting and surprising with the, um, with the role. Um, yeah, so, so it's, it, the casting, casting is, a, is a big one. And also trying to do something called the chemistry test. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but quite often if you've got two actors who have to do a lot of um, playing off each other, you're maybe bringing groups of actors again to, to do casting sessions where you can pair them up and mix and match them and sort of see who has the best chemistry yeah. uh, playing together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, bear with me. Just turning on. Got heavy rain here now. It's getting a bit dark outside. Um, so anyway, so that was Black. Really, from there, um, I started developing more feature scripts. Um, and then I started doing some TV drama, which was interesting. So I have a production company um, that I've run with uh, the writer and producer that I've been working with. And we started making uh, some dramas for Sky. Um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but the, the most recent project we did was, um, was for a strand called Urban Myths. Now, Sky Arts, um, I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they've been making this series for about the last three or four years called Urban Myths. And what they are is they're, they're sort of half hour um, single dramas where they're based around, based around half truths to do with famous people where they're obviously an urban myth that may or may not have happened. But one of the urban myths they did uh, a couple of years ago, which I thought was great, was about Bob Dylan. And the story is that Bob Dylan had met Dave Stewart and they had uh, been hanging out, I believe, in America. And Dave Stewart said to Bob, look, if you ever want to come to London, just look me up. Here's my road uh, uh, name. Come pay me a visit sometime. And Dave Stewart went off, never thought he'd ever hear from Bob, uh, Bob Dylan again. And a few years later, Bob Dylan just jumped on a plane one day, flew over to the UK, had the name of the road, went to one of the houses that where he thought Dave Stewart lived, and knocked on the door, said to the lady there, hi, is Dave in? And the lady went, uh, yeah, he's just popped down to the shops. So anyway, Bob Dylan goes into the house. She offers him a cup of tea. He sits down and this is like a, it's like a small, um, um, you know, semi-detached house. And he's sitting in the front room surrounded by Bob Dylan records. And it turns out it wasn't Dave Stewart's house at all. It was another guy called Dave who was like a massive uh, Bob Dylan fan. And uh, <laughs> he, he ends up sitting there having a conversation with this um this guy who's like a Bob Dylan super fan and obviously nobody ever believes and it actually happened, but apparently this was a true story and they dramatized it and did this great, great show about it. Um, so they've done loads of things, loads of these films. They've done them about, you know, Mick Jagger and David Bowie. And we, um, we did one about Madonna. And the story is that um, we, um, we came across a story about Madonna in the 1980s who dated Basquiat, the, um, the artist and around about 1983, they were both dating in New York. Madonna was working as a cloakroom girl uh, in a nightclub, and she was about, I'd say, probably early 20s. She was a part-time model. She was singing. She just made some uh, records. And Basquiat was, um, you know, he was like the darling of the New York art scene. And he had been, um, he'd been working with Andy Warhol at that point. He had loads of great big shows on in America. And he started dating Madonna. And they had this very uh, on-off sort of fractious relationship where I think it was all very passionate and it lasted about six months. Um, and afterwards, uh, Basquiat painted a couple of famous pictures which actually featured Madonna in it. And even to this day, she still talks about her relationship with him. And I don't know if you know, but he, I think he died at about 27 as a heroin overdose. So he, he sort of peaked 
very early and had this tragic death. And LaDonna, who really was always very clean cut and didn't really go near drugs and apparently didn't really drink or anything like that, she she went on to become this um, Hollywood mega star. So we thought, well, that's, that'd be a great little story that we could tell in half an hour. And, um, and um, took it to Sky. Sky commissioned it and... They said, right, great, can you write a script? So we were thinking, well, that's quite a big story. How do you take a six-month story like that and actually boil that relationship down? So we ended up um, approaching a writer called Sarah Soleimani. And Sarah Soleimani, um, she was in a TV show called Him and Her. Uh, she's done loads of TV shows over the years, and she's done a lot of writing as well. And she, she most recently wrote on a show called Barry, which was a big show for HBO, and she just she won quite a, a few awards for doing it so we got her involved and she came up with this brilliant idea which was to tell the story over one night so rather than try and tell a story about the entire relationship maybe show us a snapshot of their relationship where um yeah you, you can uh, spend an evening with them in new york in the 1980s and the idea was that they come out of a nightclub basket had a famous um <laughs> there was a famous famous dust up in a nightclub where Madonna had gone to a club and Basquiat had another girlfriend and um, Madonna had a cat fight on the on the night on the dance floor with uh, this other girlfriend and um, it was quite a big public thing that lots of people were talking about at the time so our film starts with that with them tumbling out of the nightclub after the fight they run through the streets of New York they go down into the subway and they get onto a subway train and they basically ride the subway train uh for half an hour on the underground until they get off and they sort of throughout through that little journey and through that evening they um you know they they sort of connect emotionally they talk about their love life but then at the same time they are interacting with all these night owls who live in new york at the time because you can imagine a, a subway carriage in the middle of night in new york back then it was a pretty hostile place you had all sorts of interesting characters on there some pleasant some unpleasant um, and it was about their interactions with them. So we started working out how we could do this on the fairly modest budget that Sky had given us. I mean, it was a good budget, but it wasn't really enough to start building New York street, you know, new, full New York sets or um, building a train carriage. And we didn't know quite how to achieve it. So we started looking at options in the UK um and started costing things up and very quickly it became clear that it was not going to happen because actually if you go to a film studio in london at the moment everything is full up i mean all the big film studios are using pinewood and shepperton and three mills and all these sort of places for their big films and they're booked up for years and years and unless you're paying five or ten grand a day you're just not going to get into them so we we thought okay maybe we could try and shoot this overseas so I've been working, uh, in the past I've worked with a, a director of photography called Ed Wild. And Ed um, Ed had done, well, he shot Raw with me and he shot another drama with me for Sky. And he'd started making big action films. And he made a film called London Has Fallen. Now, London Has Fallen was a big action film, um, which they, they actually shot out mostly out in the studio in Bulgaria. And, I, and as the title suggests, it was a London-based film. So they, they shot a number of weeks in London, but the rest of the film was all done in this uh, Bulgarian studio. And I thought, well, how does that work? And Ed said, well, look, get on a plane, go out there, have a look at the studio, because I think you'll be surprised. I think they have a train carriage, and I think they have um, a back lot, which would work perfectly for what you're doing. So I, I went out there last year, I went to this film studio in, in the mountains of Bulgaria, not sure what to expect and I actually found this amazing studio called new new Boyana studios and the story behind this place was that it was um it used to be a soviet propaganda studio as far as i'm aware where um back in the day they would uh, when the um, uh, bulgaria had a soviet presence they would make films there and then uh, the russians left and uh, then a new film production company called millennium films bought it about 10 or 15 years ago, spent loads of money on it and built a, lots of backlots, which had a New York set. It had a London set. It's got Rome. It's got, um, it's got um, um, Midwest houses. It's got all these amazing sets they built around the studio. 
So I went to have a look at it and had a look at their New York set. And we, were, we looked at it and thought, this is absolutely perfect. We've got all these streets that just look like the middle of Manhattan. Now, all the crossroads, all the subways, all the little restaurants and cafes. But the way it works is that it only goes up about three or four stories high. So anything beyond that, quite often what they do in the films is that they will uh, put digital set extensions on it. So they'll, they'll film the sets and then everything becomes extended afterwards. So they'll paint out the mountains that you'll see behind the set and replace it with the New York skyline. And this blew my mind because before this, every project I had ever done had really been on location. And if you've ever done location filming, um, as great, great as it is being in situ on an, in an amazing location, it's always really logistically difficult. And where I've, whenever I've come unstuck, it's because you end up choosing a location or try, try and uh, fill your day with maybe shoots that span a number of locations. And you spend so much time just putting gear into a truck, moving, getting it out of the truck, setting it up. Every time you do that, you lose hours. Um, and suddenly going into a studio, I realised this is incredible because actually you've got um, a studio where we were, what we were doing was we were using a soundstage to build our subway carriage. But at the same time, we'd have the New York backlot set just through a door. So you could literally step out the door and suddenly you're into the streets of New York. So your camera team would be setting it up, lighting it, dressing it exactly how you wanted it for the for the drama. Um, and at the same time, you'd have everything else going on just all, you know, all within a, a five minute walk of you. So the stunt team might be planning one thing in one room. You've got the hair and makeup just around the corner. So you can, you know, you as a director, you can very easily jump between things. And if you're ever directing bigger projects in the future, you'll find that you <laughs> very quickly get, pulled in many different directions where you're having to talk to all the departments all the time there's always questions to answer and um, nothing beats sort of being in the room talking to that person so you go to the art department give them a bit of guidance then go back onto the set and you you know make sure that the construction for the the train carriage is working and it, it was it was great it was a really amazing experience so actually when it came to doing the new york um shoot we populated the street with the period cars we pumped um, things up on, the, on all the advertising hoarding and uh, things in the shop windows which will look correct for that period. Um, you could do a wet down. So if you've ever done a wet down, you know, usually um, you end up with, if you're doing this on location, they'll have a great big Bowser truck full of water and they get almost like a, a fire engine hose and just wet down the street so you get all these lovely reflections from from all the lighting. But again, on a back lot, it's great. They can just plug it into a, a water main and just hose down the street so everything's immediately wet and then we could stick a crane right in the middle of the street so we had um we had a you know a, a 30 foot crane on a track so again you could put it right in the middle of the road you could do these great big lovely sweeping shots going from the buildings right across the road following the actors going into the subway station and um i'd never done things like that before because quite often if you've ever tried to shoot in the middle of central london you can maybe get permission to shoot somewhere but you can never shut down the, the streets you can never really fully control the location and you certainly can't stop putting cranes in the middle of the road uh, and, and and achieve shots like that unless you are making say a working title movie or something like that where you've got unlimited resources so that was amazing um, and actually building the uh, the train set itself that was um, that was an experience because we had found a shell of a train uh, which uh, they'd actually used for another movie. I think they'd used it as almost like a Moscow um, train from the 1950s or something like that. And they basically, because they didn't need it anymore, they took it away and they dumped it in a field. And this thing was a real mess. But the, the, the structure of the carriage was there. So we looked at it and went, OK, we could get that put back in the studio and use that as a shell and actually gut the entire thing and transform it into a, a 1980s New York subway carriage. So that's what we did. So we basically had like the uh, the main car uh, carriage and then either end we had um, almost like a short carriage. So it wasn't the entire thing, but it was enough. So you, you had a doorway to walk through and you gave the illusion that you were looking through a train. And then what we did was we put mirrors either end of the train. So filming on the car carriage, um, the, the mirrors would slightly rotate 
and what it did is it gave the illusion that um, you were looking through to like an infinity amount of carriages going all the way down the line. As long as you angled it so you weren't really pointing it straight at an actor, at an actor where it was a clear reflection. By twisting it, you got the impression that the train was sort of slowly moving through the tunnels. And it was great because I love all that um, in-camera trickery because uh, so often these days everyone becomes reliant on trying to do stuff in post and green screen these things and we didn't really have the budget to do that so these are sort of techniques that um, people have been using for years and years and you just never really uh, you're never really aware of it until somebody shows you what can be achieved um, so we did that and then we wanted the idea of movement of the train actually going through the station and in our story the idea is that Madonna and Basquiat travel through about seven or eight different carriages. So they're constantly walking through the train and the train intermittently stops at various subway stations through the story. So we were thinking, well, how do we make it appear that first of all, the train's moving and how do we sell the idea that it's actually pulling into a station and pulling away again? Because this great big set was enormous and you couldn't move the train. So we started coming up with ideas to achieve this. And we did a lot of storyboarding and work, tried to work it out. And what we came up with as a plan was we um, we first started with lighting because we thought, well, when you're on a train and you're moving through a tunnel, quite often you have work lights, you have tungsten work lights on the walls. So how do you achieve that? So what we did was we put um, um, something called, what are they called? Uh, they're not in capture lights. I can't even remember what they're called now. They're basically long LED tubes, which are totally pro uh, programmable. So you put it into a computer and you can get them to strobe in time, and we we, uh, we actually floated uh, these lights all the way down the length of each train carriage. And what would happen is that when it looked like it was pulling out of the station, we'd start the lights moving and then they would increase in speed. And then behind the windows, looking out of the windows, we put uh, rear projections. So we got somebody in New York to film out of a train for us. So we actually had um, stock footage of pulling in and out of various stations and looking out of the front window so that when the train is moving along you get a sense of the tunnel moving past you get a sense of pulling into the stations or if you're looking at the front of the train you'd see movement in the tunnel it was just really a very simple rear projection screen that we had and it seems a bit old-fashioned and maybe a little bit quaint doing it that way but actually when we looked back at the rushes we thought it looked great because it was all in camera it didn't look like an effect and you really got the sense of movement so combining that with the sound the lighting all those sorts of things gave you that sense of movement and then trying to pull the train into the station we thought well obviously our train doesn't move how do we do this so what we came up with was well if the train can't move we can move ourselves we can move the camera so when the train was coming into the station we would put down a great big length of track on the platform and the track um the camera would uh track down the length of the train and it would give the illusion that the train was moving in and again it, it just it works really well i think with the combination of the lighting moving at the right time a bit of wind a bit of smoke to give the impression of like movement and some sort of a draft all those elements coming together really look convincing and the final challenge was that we wanted a shot where we were had the camera behind our uh actor playing basquiat looking at the train and he sees madonna on the train as she pulls out of the station and he sort of gives her a look as she she disappears off into the night. So again, what we did was we put our actor on the dolly. So um, he was just ahead of the camera. So the cameraman was sat behind him. The actor was there. And what we did was we moved the actor. So the actor tracked all the way down the length of the train and the train was static. And then again, when you look the ru at the rushes back, it's absolutely convincing that the train is just accelerating and pulling out of, the, out of the station. It looks really great. So all these things for me were, were brilliant because I'd, uh, I was <laughs> learning new techniques that we, we'd we not really uh, played with before. And anything where you can sort of come with that, come up with that in-camera um, uh, sort of illusion is always really rewarding, especially if you can get it back to the edit and not have to start playing with um, additional CGI and post um so yeah so that that went out and then at the moment i'm planning on doing uh, another feature so i'm involved in another feature film which all being well will be going back to that studio again because it was it was perfect for me because they have 
all the elements there. They have um, a special effects department. They've got action departments. We're going to use the back lot uh, for their London set next time, so we can use the, uh, the London streets for some of these action sequences that we're doing. And again, it's quite involved. There's a lot of stunt work. There will be a lot of things which involve wire work and green screens and things like that. But I think having been through the experience of being in a studio where you can have so much control and um, not have to move the units around, everything just is there. I've been a bit spoiled now. I kind of think that that's, that's the way to go ahead. So my plan is to try and um, do some filming in London and actually take the actors out into the streets where there's production value in being in central London where it might be being in the city or being down near Piccadilly Circus or somewhere like that where you could never really recreate that on, in, in, uh, through a build. Film those elements there, but then for the rest of it, when it comes to interiors or the street scenes, because we have lots of shots of Soho, um, my plan is to try and populate this back lot and dress it exactly the way we want to, light it the way we want to, Fill it, flood, flood it full of extras and then we can do all the scenes that we need there on that back lot because we I, i've just recognized that we'll have so much more control just by doing it that way i think um the one thing i always um uh, wish i had more of when i'm directing any project is, is time you know time just leaks through your fingers there's a bit of a uh, uh, an expression that uh, me and my ad that i work with have which is uh Hollywood in the morning, Hollywood, Hollyoaks in the afternoon. And the, the idea is that, you know, when you start your day, everybody thinks, oh, we're making a film. It's all, you know, great. We can do multiple rehearsals. We can take our time and get it right. And you spend the morning crafting stuff. And as the day progresses, time slowly leaks through your fingers and little things happen that you weren't foreseeing, which, you know, you're always having to fix problems on set. And very quickly, the day starts running away from you. And by the time you get to the end of the day, you're suddenly shooting like crazy and sometimes it gets to the point where I'm literally doing one take of a scene and just going have we got it great got it move on and you're on to the next thing and you're just terrified that you're not going to make your day or, or get the coverage so anything you can do to give you that amount of um, control or um, avoid the logistical pit holes, pitfalls that you would have from shooting in difficult locations or moving kit and crew around. I always, I always try and recommend that. Um, I've done a few talks to uh, other universities and spoken to um, film students who might be making their graduation films. And I think sometimes in the past, I've, uh, I've, I've actually come in to try and consult and give them a bit of guidance on some of the shoots that they're doing. But again, the, the, the one thing I see people um, doing quite frequently is that they will try and maybe be a bit optimistic and try and fit too much into a day or they will choose a location to do their short filming where it's just um, becomes unworkable because you may walk into a space and go this is brilliant it works for a story but you always forget that by the time you bring in all the flight cases and the crew and if you don't have the luxury of having a second unit base to put everybody in you know the house or the location you're in is flooded with people you uh, you you probably you may have experienced this but you might be shooting in one direction and as soon as you turn the camera around because you think right great we're going to shoot in the other direction you realize that the back of the shot is full of flight cases and bits of track and things like that that you can just never seem to get rid of or lose and we had that problem with blackwood actually because again we were filming in this house had every room uh, when i walked into it i thought this is perfect i'd love to do all these steady cam shots where we float from room to room and can make it all very fluid and seamless but by the time we were actually shooting the film, I hadn't anticipated that pretty much every room we weren't shooting in suddenly becomes full of other people's stuff. So we'd have a video village in one room, makeup in another, wardrobe in another. And you can paint yourself into a corner. So that's you know a bit of advice is just always be mindful of that stuff. Anything you can do to save you time and make your shooting day as easy as possible, I'd re really recommend. <laughs> Brilliant. I think, Adam, we're, we're kind of we're getting close to half past twelve, and I think we've we've kind of we've got you for another 10, 15 minutes or so. So maybe if we kind of take a, a kind of an opportunity now to answer any questions, hopefully a few of you uh, have formulated something to ask Adam. So if we could uh, hand over to the students, don't let me down, guys. Come on. 
Like my question uh, was more on sort of the equipment. Being a director, obviously, you have a certain image that you want to do with your mm. films, and um, have you found it easier with the amount of equipment that's coming through with all the the new gimbals coming out, the the glide cams, and sort of the different lenses? Have you found that easier to find your image, or is it now become harder because there's so much choice? Um, it's certainly become easier because. The first few projects I did, we were shooting on um, Super 35, and I don't know if you've had experience working with kit like that, but obviously they're, they're huge cameras. They've yeah. got great big magazines on the back. They're just you know very cumbersome pieces of kit. Now, uh, using the Reds or the Aries, everyone these days mostly uses. It's, it's you know it's two choices. It's like do you go with Ari or Red? Mostly, um, they're so compact and so small. And actually shooting with things like the Ari Min Minis, you can pretty much anywhere you like which is great i think it means that you can can be a bit more fluid mm. with your shots and i think um there's an expectation to try and make everything a little bit more ambitious anyway these days um everyone keeps raising the bar with you know creative storytelling and one shot sequences so um certainly the the, the gimbal systems offers you a lot more creative scope and i think as long as it doesn't become a gimmick and it's, it's serving the story it's all fine. Um, again, the old older Steadicam systems were so big and cumbersome that they trying to actually shoot, say, like in a domestic space and follow actors around was always very difficult. But things yeah. like the the I don't know if you've seen the Trinity, but the Trinity rig I used recently, and that was amazing because it's um, it's a Steadicam with a um, a gimbal at the top, and the camera can basically swing down or it can swing back up, and oh. with an Alexa it can shrink down very small. Um, yeah. It's always the lenses. Really, I mean, the, the buck stops now with the lenses because generally you can get very small primes, but you're always beholden to the size of the lens. And quite often, you know, telephoto lens is still enormous, <laughs> generally. Yeah. Um, but the other thing as well is you can mix formats a bit more successfully than you ever used to. If you were shooting on film and then you try and mix it with anything digital, it could really stand out. But I think trying to do drone work and things like that these days, things like the DJI drones... Um, the quality of what they can do these days, you can cut it in with multiple formats. And I think, I think it's a lot more forgiving with a good grade. Yeah. Fair enough. It's just, um, cause that's one thing I struggle with, especially in, uh, I'm into my photography and, um, I get branching out into filmmaking and short films and, um, sitting down and going through, right. Okay. What I'm going to need. And I, I find myself, I, I, get too invested in the equipment and then I, I turn up with hundreds of pieces of equipment that I might not use so I didn't know whether that come across into industry standard or is it more you set a plan and you know exactly what you're going to use for each individual shot or do you try a couple of different things I think everything's moving so fast these days that you can fall into this trap of buying kit and finding out that 12 months down the line it's redundant so sometimes yeah. you have to accept that maybe maybe like buying stuff and selling it again before it <laughs> loses its value is, is is the trick to it um i mean the one thing that's really changed stuff for me is that you can um, um the cameras are a lot more forgiving so whereas in the past you'd shoot on film and you'd, you'd work from a video assist where go back 20 years ago you'd have a little black and white monitor yeah it didn't represent the final image at all and you were kind of crossing your fingers that the, the DP had lit it right, and then you, you, you know, you, the, the the proof is in the pudding when you see the rushes. These days, I can sit there with a, a nice 17 inch monitor, and you can even plug in a, a LUT or a pre grade on it. So you, you already know, have a pretty good idea of what's working or not. So, actually, working with DPs, we've started to underlight stuff quite a lot. I mean, one of my favorite directors is David Fincher, and if you look at the work he does, I mean, he, he really uh, underlights stuff and uses practicals. Uh, a huge amount these days so you know, you can uh, you can really um go quite extreme with um with with the underlighting not not um you know not not doing that temptation which is to try and overlight everything yeah so i've got i've got one more question um on that and then i'm kind of done with my question with direct directors of photography do you have set ones that you use or do you open that up to applications or how, how's that process for you? And with directors of photography, well, um, I, I've worked with lots of people over the years. I think it comes down to a, a number of factors. Sometimes you, um, 
you know, you just you, you choose the best person for the job. So yeah. sometimes you might be making um, I might be making a project where it feels like it needs to be very controlled and the, the, the challenge is lighting it beautifully. And so there's a couple of DPs I know who've come from a background of working in commercials. Okay. And they, you know, they you can guarantee that their work will always look beautiful and they will make something very cinematic, but they might not be the quickest people to work with and to with and they might be a little bit more uncom- compromising. So yeah. you, you have to sacrifice your coverage with the amount of, um, you know, and just accept that you're going to get fewer shots, but they will all look beautiful. Other guys I've worked with might be handheld, and I know that they're really strong on the storytelling and coverage front. So I've worked with a number of different people, and, I, and also it's down to availability. Everybody always ends up <laughs> moving on to other projects. So you might be working with somebody for two or three projects, and the next time something comes up, they, you know, they're doing another TV show, and you have to look elsewhere. But I think it's quite good to move around and have different people to work with because actually every time I've worked with a different head of department, I learn new things from them because they always have a different approach to their work anyway. Awesome. Thank you ever so much for that. Welcome. Okay, anybody else with questions for Adam? I was just going to ask a very simple question of, um, you mentioned about lenses. I know some directors have a specific affinity for a particular lens, like Kubrick with 50 mil. Do you have anything particular, or are you happy to have a wide range of uses? Um, I think when we've done projects in the past, rather than trying to have um, just every every lens there and available, we'll try and make a call early on that maybe we'll use four or five key lenses. Um, and... I, I, I think I, when I progressed into to doing more film work, I started to realise the, the 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 value of of using wider lenses. I do like using wide lenses and try and try and set the space because <laughs> there's always this temptation, especially when you're working off smaller monitors, that people like to keep things quite tight because it's not representative of what of what you see on the big screen. And when you start shooting your work, if you ever film something and take it to a cinema, you realise. Sometimes I've looked at my work and thought, thought, I've shot that on a 24 and that should have been an 18. You know, you could have gone much wider because actually yeah. on a big screen, um, everything's up there to see and actually you don't have to be tight in on people's faces. Um, I think every project is different though, to be quite honest. Um, with um, with the project we did in, in um, Bulgaria, the one at the film studio, because I was working with a DP where we said, look, we want to keep it so it feels quite intimate. You're working with the actors all the time and we're going to have to work really fast to, to make the days. I think we found one lens that we pretty much stayed on for most of it. So instead of us um, changing lenses and pushing in on the lens, we moved ourselves. So I think we, we, we ended up working on, it was either 24 or 35, I forget, but we were, we were moving ourselves around and it, it actually worked very well that way because you're, you're not losing time having to change the lens every time you uh, go to a new setup oh, thank you that's great thank you okay anybody else yeah um do you have any tips or advice on getting permission to film in a location um i think that if you are if you're doing a project for um a big TV company or a film, they will always expect the permissions to be um, done by the book, really. And fil- again, filming in London is, is incredibly difficult these days because um, if you've ever had any experience of this, um, you, you know, you need you need the streets shut, locked down, you need permission statements from anybody who features prominently in the shot. Sometimes you need police to come down and... Uh, monitor everything so it becomes very very difficult hence as trying to do more stuff away from london and shoot shoot overseas for certain things but i think if you probably if you're making a student film i've done lots of stuff where i've gone quite guerrilla style and i think i think that there's <laughs> the 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 lines can be blurred a little bit um if i think if you're if you're basically if you're doing anything where there's some monetary gain at the end of it uh, i think you have to do it by the book but i expect with student films um, it can be a little bit more casual. But what, what were you thinking in particular? Are you thinking for, have you got a particular project coming up? 
Um, me and a few friends are sort of working on something on the side. A lot of it's set outdoors in woods and sort of old ruined temples and stuff like that. And I'm sort of wondering, how do you go out with a camera crew and all that in a public woods and sort of not get people calling the police, basically? <laughs> <laughs> I think no, knowing you, Dan, if I can just take this one, don't wave any swords around. And if you're waving swords around, tell the police that you're going to be doing it, Dan. That's be my advice to you. Um, and I think if you're, if you're, I, I'm kind of with Adam on this. I think there's an element of it's sometimes easier to gain forgiveness than it is permission. And sort of guerrilla filmmaking allows you that that freedom. But if you're if you're going to be using you, you described them as temples. I imagine it's kind of stone ruins or, or, or you know, anything like that. Then, then try and find out who owns the woodlands and just try and gain permission before you go out and do it. Yeah. Right. Cool. Definitely fine. If you go in with a, um, a quite open and honest about what it is you're doing and, and um, make it clear that it's not for commercial gain, people are usually quite receptive to it. But okay. usually usually quite happy to help and sometimes they can be more accommodating uh, we've had people in the past go yeah that's fine and we'll make sure that we can open this gate in this farmer's field so you can park your car nearer to the location and you know pe people generally do like to help yeah all right thanks any more before we let adam go in and, and carry on with his day no i've got one more go yeah. on then george um so what advice would you give to someone who hasn't exactly had experience um, with film, like going into a filming audition? Like what, what advice would you give like just to going into film and working with directors? And Sorry, do you mean from an acting point of view? How would you... In general, really. From... Um... Sorry, just to clarify the question a little bit more, are you, you, you're saying... Uh, I'm an actor, and I, if I was... Because I'm going to probably be doing both acting and film. Like, Do you have any advice for just if I'm going into... And I'm working with directors, like what's like things to do, not to do, or just things okay. like that, right? Um, well, I think... I mean, it's amazing how many times I've worked with actors where <laughs> they haven't done prep. Um, it sounds terrible, but um, I mean, on the whole, most actors, you know, they're very studious and they will go in and put the time into a project to try and get their head around the material. But I, I'm always surprised by how many people do to turn up having just maybe read their pages and not have not really got their head around the whole story, you know. So if, if, if um, an agent gives the actor a script and they maybe feature in five pages, they'll just read those five pages. But I think it's always important to, to know the narrative because... Um, you know, things that maybe happened on other pages might impact the way they choose to play their character. Um, I think when you get auditions, um, go in with a fairly strong idea. Sometimes making bold choices can be really good. I think if, if every time I've seen an actor that's really stood out to me, it's because they've made a, a, an interesting choice and done something to surprise me. It might be like the, the, the choice that we end up with in the on the day when we do the filming, but it's something where I thought that's interesting. They've really thought about this and tried to do something that's not just what is on the page okay. the angle and just, just listening, okay. listening to uh, any direction in the audition as well. You know, if, if a director tries to direct you in an audition, it's because they are trying to explore whether you can come at the scene with a different approach. So um, going, going out on a limb, Surprising people and making bold choices, I think, is the way to go. Okay, thank you. And I've got one final question that Vicky's just typed in on, on the, the chat here, Adam. So uh, she says, I expect, and I, I think we, we know this, we're going to see a lot of films which are set in space or in a solo scenario, so people working kind of on their own due to lockdown. So have you got any final tips for students working on film projects but being limited with collaboration during these kind of mm. lockdown times? Interesting. Um, I, the, uh, as you all know, filmmaking is collaborative. You do need you, know, you need people to work with. But I I came from a background where I just grab the camera and shoot stuff myself. And I think I think these days um, 
it's easier than it's ever been to try and make stuff with a reduced crew. Um, if you can, um, just try and keep the numbers down to an absolute minimum. I'm always quite surprised by how many people there are on bigger film sets where there always seems to be a, a lot of people. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I sometimes wish that you could keep things a little bit leaner so you could work faster. Um, so um, if you've got the technical ability to shoot stuff and direct at the same time and give stuff minimal lighting, um, then I'd say go for it. Um, quite often, every time I've done a project where it feels like you're limited by the amount of people in the scene and the locations, it can turn into a real strength because you're not wasting time and energy on trying to um, spread yourself too thin. So um, I think now is a perfect time to be looking at doing creative little contained pieces that you can shoot in in um, you know in environments i would have thought that coming out the other side of this when everybody starts to reintegrate themselves a bit more into society i'm sure people will be desperate to shoot projects and i've spoken to a few friends who are planning short films and i think that you may find that there are people who are in the industry or a little bit more experienced who are quite happy to come on board and help you maybe with your short film projects that maybe you you hadn't considered um in the past i've had a lot I've been surprised by how many experienced people have been willing to give their time and come in and work on short films and projects that I've done because they like you, they recognise it's just a few days of their time. And if you've got a good script and, um, you know, a bit, bit, of, bit of a plan of attack, people, people will generally get involved. Brilliant. OK, well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know. I think I, I found it really useful. Hopefully, the students have found it really useful. I guess all that remains to say is, uh, on behalf of all the students, if you want to say it as well, guys, just a big thank you to Adam. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Um, <laughs> no, I, I found it really interesting. So, um, brilliant. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Hopefully, we'll see you again. I'll try and get you involved in some stuff sort of during term time when you're not too busy i'll just keep pestering you and um yeah thanks for your time dude yeah well good luck with everything guys i know it's a strange time with everyone being locked down but i think uh, i think there'll be some good times ahead and hopefully if i can be of any, got any questions or want to follow this up anything um, i have no doubt you'll be you'll be inundated with work experience requests <laughs> Very well. Anyway, nice to see you all. Good luck with uh, good luck with your projects. Cool. Thanks, Thanks Adam. Adam. Take care. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. Mm -hmm.